We are continuing our series, You Can Be Free. And this morning, we're talking about suffering. And that's always the question, how in the world can I be free from sin, free from death, free from all of the things that sin does, and yet, why do I still suffer? Why do I still experience hardship? Why does this not fit? And we're going to talk about this this morning. Um... I really appreciated Clay last week, even though I was in Redverse, hanging out with them. Redverse, I'm glad you're tuning in. Now I appreciate what Redverse Sunday morning looks like, and so the plan is for me to be there over there, over there more, but Clay, I appreciated you last week. Uh, I appreciate you tying it in with the service. It was good. It just all worked, so uh, we will get you back. I think that will just get you a regular rotation. That, that works. I like that idea. I don't know if he does, but I like that idea. Um, No, it's good. I love how, and we didn't talk about this, I love how God is at work, and he speaks to different ministries, different pastors, different churches, and we can all be in unison with theme, all be in unison with thought, without ever talking, and is a good reminder that we all serve one spirit, and that he is communicating to us, even if we are not communicating with each other. Um... So we are continuing our series, and to kick things off, I was reminded, has anyone been watching the curling? I I think there's curling on right now. There seems to be always curling on. Is anybody watching it right now? Everyone online? No. Nobody? That's fine. That's that's okay. Um, But thinking about that, when I was in high school, I didn't play hockey. I curled because um, I couldn't hand, eh, there's a bunch of reasons I didn't play hockey. Anyways, I played curling. And uh, I was pretty good at it, not to blow my own horn, but I I was pretty good, but I had one slight problem. I have really bad knees. In particular, my right knee is really bad, and I would get down into the hack. I'm not even going to try to do it, Um, and my knee would pop, and I would literally be stuck. I could not extend my leg at that moment if it popped. And it would always happen about middle of the game. I'd have to take a couple ends off just to loosen it up, which is really inconvenient when you're the skip. You know, if you're the lead, it's not a big deal because everybody else is better and they can fill in. But when you're the skip calling the shots, that's a really big problem. And so often I wouldn't get to skip because everyone knew at some point, anyways, it got better. It hasn't happened in a while. I would love to get back into it. Maybe my knees have better other ideas, but uh, anyways, I have bad knees. That's the whole point of it. <laughs> my head mic is causing... I asked ask this question. Is there, is there anybody in the house that has lingering pains or injuries? What hurts and why? Everyone online, you can throw it in the comment section. Talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to switch my mic. Perfect. It was very on. Okay, there we go. This will work much better. That's it. Time to get a new mic. Okay. Uh, Anybody, is there anyone brave enough this morning? I I shared about my knees. Anyone have a lingering? Margaret, what do you got? Apparently, curling and knees are not a good combination. Um, So we got some bad knees. Anybody else? Any... I also have bad shoulders. I could be here all day talking about all the problems I have. But anyways, <laughs> I got issues. Um, anybody else? No? Okay, that's fine. You know. You know if you got hurts and owies. But um, so we've been talking about in the series about freedom in Christ, that you can be free if you want to be. And the first, part, the first half of chapter 8 was all about basically you have a choice. If you continue to serve the flesh, if you continue to serve your sinful desires, if you continue to serve the ideals of the world, there's only one outcome that is awaiting you, and that is death. There is pain, there is hurt, there is death that awaits. But if you continue to, but if you serve the Spirit, if you put the ways of God, if you put God's teaching, if you put God's voice as the loudest in your mind, 
then what awaits you is peace and life. And then the second, <coughs> and then the second week we talked about how uh, actually if we serve sin, sin treats us like a slave, that it just abuses us, it just takes everything and never gives anything back. And like a slave in the old times, when you stop being useful, you're disposed. But when we serve God, you come into the spirit of adoption. And you become sons and daughters of God. And instead of there being no future, you have endless opportunities awaiting you because you don't just serve a God, you don't just serve a father, but you are adopted into the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God Almighty who created the heavens and the earth. And so there's nothing but upside when we serve that God. But we talk about peace, and we talk about life, and we talk about, and then at the end of last, the last time I spoke, Paul threw in this little thing that we are co-heirs with Christ if we share in his life and in his suffering. Wait, what? We just talked about peace, and we just talked about life, and we just talked about others, all this good stuff. What is that suffering word doing there? And Paul picks it up this morning. We're in verse 18 this morning, 18 to 25, and Paul is going to continue on with this idea that as believers, there is always, oh, not just believers, as long as we are on this planet, as long as we are living this life, there is going to be trials, there's going to be hardship, and there's going to be suffering. It's going to be fun service. Okay, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was not subjected to futility, not willingly. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. And hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. Now hope that is seen is not hope. I did read that right. Okay. For who hopes for what he sees? It seems really confusing. I'll unpack that. But we hope for what we do not see. We wait for it with patience. Now, Paul talked about a lot of things, but he kicked it all off by saying it doesn't matter. The suffering that you endure now is nothing compared to the glory that we will experience. And if you've never read the story of Paul, Paul knows a thing or two about suffering. He was stoned to death. He was shipwrecked multiple times. He's in prison multiple times. And prison is not like prison today where you get a bed and three meals and you get an exercise court. Prison back then was chained to a wall. Some, depending on the prison, they chained you in the split so that you would cramp up. That was the plan to cause as much uncomfortable pain as possible. Prison, and it was usually like I would not fit in prison because they intentionally built the prison small enough that you had to crouch over and be hunched over the whole time you were in there. Prison was awful, and he did it multiple times. And so when Paul talks about suffering, he talks about it in a way that maybe we're not quite familiar with, but it doesn't change. And I don't say that to undermine the fact that we suffer. We all go through hardship. We all experience suffering. For some of it's a physical pain. For some of us, it's emotional pain. For, those, for some, it's a loss. But we all have these tough times, and we suffer, and we go through trials, and it's just like, why? And Paul says it doesn't matter how bad it gets because he promises you that God's love for you and the plan he has for you, the glory that awaits you will far exceed anything that you will go through in this life. And then Paul talks about creation. It's like, why in the world, when we're talking about suffering and us, would you bring up creation? And we all too often forget that when sin came into the world, it was not just humanity that was affected. All of creation was affected by sin. 
One of the curses that God talked about for Paul or for Adam when he was after he had sinned was that the ground would not produce fruit for him. It would he would have to work it hard because it's going to produce thistles. It's going to be dry and he's going to have to. It wasn't going to be easy for him. And that was just the first look into the fact that all of creation has been affected by sin. And all of creation is eagerly longing for the day when we don't get sick anymore. and We don't die anymore. And we're not weighed down by this curse. Creation waits. And then he says that he's waiting for the adoption of the sons of God. But last week we talked about that we're already adopted. So how are we adopted but not adopted? And this is the part that we often forget in the church, is that, yes, you are saved. You are set free from the power of sin and death. You have been redeemed, but you will not fully realize it until the return of Christ. You will not experience, because we say that you are free from sickness, but guess what? We're all still going to get sick. We are free from the power of death, and yet, guess what? <laughs> We're all going to die, unfortunately. That's the one thing we all have in common. Everyone dies. So how is it? And what Paul is saying is that you have gotten a taste. And the taste, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself in the message, but we've gotten a taste of salvation. We've got a taste that God has set our mind free. He has set our our heart's free. He has redeemed the way that we think and the way that we see the world, but he hasn't, the redemption isn't completed yet. And there's still a war to be waged. There's still pain in this world. There's still hurt, and we are still going to experience it until Christ returns. But the good news and the hope that Paul is talking about in this passage is that that is the good news. That is the hope. Christ has not come yet. There's still tough times. There's still hardships in this life. But God is coming. Redemption is coming. Salvation is coming. The full realization of your commitment to Christ is coming. You just have to wait a little bit longer. Because we don't, just because we don't have it now doesn't mean it's not here. And that's why he's talking about why do you hope for what you already have? We have not, we don't have the full realization of our salvation. We don't have the full realization of our freedom. We can live in our freedom now, but there's more freedom coming. There's more blessing coming. There's more glory coming. And I was thinking about this this week. I realize that this is one of the things that we as a church, and I'm talking about church in general. I don't throw us particularly under the bus. I throw everybody under the bus. This is one of the things that the church has not done well, is that we present the gospel in a super simplistic way. Give your life to Christ, and life gets better. But what happens when life doesn't get better? And, as, and I, I'm trying to stay like positive and uplifting, but I've been reading Job. If you've never read Job, um, here's, here's the tidbit of what Job's all about. Job was a faithful guy who loved God, and then all of a sudden, all of his riches, all of his wealth, all of his kids, and all of his health were taken from him in the blink of an eye. And the whole book of Job is him talking to his three buddies, and his three buddies have this super simplistic understanding of God that if you love God and do everything God ever tells you, that it's only ever going to be good and bad things only happen to people who don't love God. And that's simply not true. And Job is the example because he's sitting there and he's like, I've never done anything wrong. And when I did, I went and I offered my sacrifices and I repented and I, I mourned my error and I made it right with God. So why are these bad things happening? And Job actually sees the world as it is. Because he's looking at it and he's saying, why is it that those that are far from God still experience wealth and still experience good times and never seem to experience anything bad? And I've only ever done what God asked me to do. And why am I going through all of this? And if you've ever gone through a tough time, if you've ever experienced suffering, I'm sure that you have said some of these things that Job said. 
I have been faithful. I've done everything I thought God asked of me. So why am I going through this tough time? It's because we live in a sinful, fallen world. And though we are free and though we have been redeemed from the slavery of sin and death, the, the curse is still all around us and still affects us. And we still go through hard times. And this is the down part, but it gets better. Verse 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He searches hearts, knows what is in the mind of the Spirit. He who searches hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Paul says when it gets too hard, when it feels like it's too much, when you feel like you don't have the answers, and you feel this is the part of the redemption that you've got already. You've got the Spirit of God. And there's nothing too big for God's spirit. There's nothing that God's spirit doesn't have answers for. He is the one that strengthens us. He is the one who gives us the endurance and the peace to push through because nothing lasts forever. And that's the toughest part when we're going through a hard time is it feels like it will never end. And the truth is that it will end, but we just have to stay strong. And when we feel like we're giving up, when we feel like it's too much, that's when we lean on God's spirit and say, help me, spirit of God. Give me the strength. Give me the endurance to push through because I know that you're a good God. I know that things are going to turn around. But right now, it's really tough, and I need your help. The good news is, is that not only is the Spirit that dwells within you, not only is the Holy Spirit that is the seal of your salvation dwelling in you and strengthening you through these times, but He's also always petitioning your Heavenly Father on your behalf because the spirit knows your heart he knows your mind he knows what you're going through and so he is seeking god the same way that jesus in heaven intercedes and prays for you the spirit within you is praying for you in groanings too deep for words as paul said in those moments where you don't know what to say when things are so tough and you don't have the answers, and you just get to that point where you're like, I don't even know what to pray anymore. It's okay, because the Spirit in you knows what to pray. The Spirit in you knows exactly what you need, knows exactly how to ask God, what to ask God. I talked about when we were praying that sometimes we ask God the wrong questions. The Spirit never asks the wrong questions. He's always, He knows your heart, He knows your mind, and He is the strength, he is the little bit of glory we have now that helps us endure when things get really tough. And then he closes with this, verses 28 to 30. And we know, verse 28 is a verse that I'm sure most of us have memorized at some point in our life. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. All things. One of the cool things about this small group. If you haven't been to small group in a while, you've been missing out. I'm just going to say it just like that. Uh, one of the cool things that we've worked through in small group is we ta took time, we looked back at our past experiences. And when we're going through, we, I intentionally told the group, I said, do not brush past those tough times. Because the point of the study we're doing at small group is to discover the vision and the calling and the purpose that God has placed in our life and those tough times, those sufferings, in a way that only God can, he works it to our formation. He uses it to make us stronger. Uh, they talk about how gold is refined by fire. Do you know how much refining gold would go to? A goldsmith doesn't stop burning off all the things that don't belong until he can see his reflection in the gold. That's when the gold is ready to go. It's a lot of refining. In the same way, when we go through trials, and we go through temptations, and we go through suffering, and we go through these hardships, 
even though it seems like it's meant to destroy us in a way that only God can, he uses it to refine us and strengthen us and prepare us for the things that God has called us to do. That old cliche, what the, sa- what the devil meant for evil, God has turned for good. The devil may try to use to destroy you, and that's what happened to Job. The devil tried to destroy Job, and God used it as an opportunity for him to speak to his friends and for him to stay strong in the midst of the trial. And the same goes for us. God can use, no matter how tough, and you may not see it right now, in the time of hardship, in the time of trial, in the time of suffering, we don't always see what the good is going to come, but God extends his hand. He says, I'm going to help you through this. This isn't going to last forever. This is refining you. This is strengthening you. And on the other end, we're going to use it to advance my kingdom. We're going to use it to make you stronger, to refine your character, to prepare you for this thing that I've called you to. Because each and every one of us has a calling. Each and every one of us has a purpose that God has set us apart that only we can accomplish. And as he prepares us, and as he refines us, and as we are stepping into that calling, that old cliche, God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Well, you're called. He says that he justified, he has qualified you to step into the calling that he has for you. And as we step into it, it's interesting that he closes by saying that you, he... (laughs) The called have been glorified. But wait, we haven't experienced this glory. You just talked about how the glory is a future glory. Why are you talking about it as if it's already done? Because it's such a sure thing in God's mind. That when we as sons and daughters of God step into the things that God has called us to and we allow him to do what only God can do and we are refined and perfected and made into the image of the almighty God, the image of his almighty son, the glory and the blessing that awaits us is such a sure thing that God, Paul talks about it as if it's already done. Not that you will be glorified, you have been glorified. That's a lot of scripture. It's a lot going on in 12 verses. So the question is, as you take all of this into effect, and you think about a hardship you may be going through, a trial that you're going through right now, do you think that God is using this time to refine you and prepare you for something? Is this is this a refining time? Is this a strengthening time? Is this an opportunity for you to grow in your character and your strength Uh, I'm going to close with this. I want you to think about that. Just hold on to that thought. But I'm gonna, I have something I want to give you. <laughs> uh, it is called, I teach you the prayer of serenity. Now, some of you may have know this prayer already because it's an old prayer. It's been around for a while. I did not come up with it as much as I love to take credit for it. It's been around for a while. I'm going to teach it to you, but I also want to unpack it because I don't want this prayer The same way as our Father, we don't just sit there and pray it verbatim, but we, it is more of a guide of how we're to pray to God. This prayer of serenity is the same thing. You can pray it verbatim if you want, but I actually encourage you to look at the parts and pieces of it and pray through it that way. So here it goes. Prayer of serenity. If you have the app, there's a bunch of blanks that are going to get filled in right away. Here we go. God, grant me the serenity for the things I cannot change. And serenity is another word for peace. God, grant me the peace about the things I'm going through right now that I cannot change. And for whatever reason, we can't change it. It's beyond our control. It's beyond our power. It's beyond our know-how. And there's things in our life that are causing us uncomfortableness and trial that we want to change and we know we can change, but we probably shouldn't change because you might make things worse. We all know what I'm talking about. God, grant me the peace. Grant me the strength and the serenity to get through this thing because I can't do anything about it. You can. I know you can. But I can't. So give me the peace 
And whatever I need to just endure this until it is done, grant me the serenity about the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, because there are things in our life that are causing hardship and uncomfortableness that we actually do possess the ability and the strength to overcome it, but we're just choosing not to because we're afraid. The courage to change the things that I can. And I think sometimes what has happened, oh, no, I'm going to get ahead on myself. Courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And this is probably the most important part. Because I think what happens is that times we are going through a time of trial and suffering and it is caused by a thing that is beyond our control and we try to change it ourselves. And because it was beyond our control, because it was beyond our ability to change and it didn't work out, we could become f- afraid of taking on these trials and so we just stopped trying. And there are things that are going on in your life that you maybe can't change, but there are things going on in your life that you can change, you can do something about, and you need to know which is which. You need to know what are the things that are beyond your control that you just need the peace to get through, and you need to know which are the things that you can, and and then you need the courage and the know-how or whatever it is that God needs to give you so that you can overcome it and do it in a way that glorifies God. Because sometimes we can take on challenges, (laughs) and we'll get through it, but there's collateral damage behind us. And that's not usually the best way to get through things. God, grant me the serenity. God, give me the peace about the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things that I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. My question to close off is, how could this, this prayer help you moving forward? How could saying this, how could taking the time and just stopping and just praying for God's peace and wisdom and courage help you through tough times that may come ahead as you look back on how you've dealt with things in the past? For me, I wish I had paused more often and just said, God, is this something I can change? No? Okay. Give me patience to get through it. Because it's Oh, it is? Oh, okay, then help me to do it in a way that's glorifying to you, because I'll change it. (laughs) But it may not end up the way that you want it to end up in the end. I invite the worship team to come on up. I'm going to pray as we close. Father, I... Father, I pray that we have <laughs> pray for your strength in those times, in those tough times. God, I pray for your peace in the times when we don't have answers and we don't have the strength and when the trial just seems too big. I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you are the one who strengthens us. You are the one that gives us everything we need to get through. that we would resist the temptation to just resist the temptation to take on the things that we need to just leave alone and resist the temptation to just endure it when we should actually be trying to change it. Your word says that we can ask for, for wisdom freely and I ask God that you would fill your people with wisdom. Wisdom and discernment to know which are the things we need to take on, which are the things we need to which are the things that we need to allow to form us and transform us and refine us into who you've called us to be. And thank you, God, for that calling. I thank you, God, that you can work all things to the good of those who are called. God, I pray for everyone here, whether they need strength, whether they need hope, whether they need peace, whatever it is that they are going through, God, I, you know exactly what it is, and I thank you, Spirit, that you are always praying for us, you are always interceding for us, and always, 
always there when we need you the most. Jesus, we love you. Give you our praise in your precious name. Amen.